Every star has a Goldilocks zone. Where that zone is depends on the size and temperature of the star. In our solar system, Venus marks the inner boundary and Mars the outer boundary. Earth and its abundance of life is right in the middle. The yo-yo planet passes through the Goldilocks zone twice a year, for three and a half months during the spring as it races inbound, and again in the autumn for three and a half months as it hurtles back into the colder reaches of space. Could life survive the conditions outside the Goldilocks zone? There could be life forms that are smart enough to hibernate, as do animals on the Earth during the winter season. If this sounds fantastic, I offer you the tidal zones on the Earth. On the tidal zones, life proliferates, of course, near the seashore, and they do so despite tides. The water coming in, covering many of the life forms, the water going out at low tide, and yet those species survive perfectly well. The strange cycle of the yo-yo planet's orbit creates fleeting conditions suitable for life, but also for death. Some alien planets are even more bizarre. Imagine a world that has no star to orbit. Scientists speculate that our galaxy is teeming with rogue planets adrift in the murky lanes of interstellar space. These are orphaned worlds, planets that are booted from their solar systems by the chaos of planetary migration. Astronomers call such worlds planemos. Planemos are planets without a star. They're just drifting through the galaxy indefinitely. What massive force would it take to kick a planet out of the solar system. When a young star forms with a contingent of planets around it, many of those planets gravitationally interact with each other. They yank on each other, slingshot each other, so that one of them is ejected from the planetary system, voted off the island, if you will. If you were, fortunately, a resident on a planet that was kicked out by a, a collision or a near collision with another large object, you'd probably rapidly move out of the habitable zone. There are hundreds of billions of these lost, wayward, poor, wandering planets out in our Milky Way galaxy with no parent star to warm them up. Cold. Dark and quiet. Because Planemos have no sun, they are worlds without days or years. They keep vigil through an eternal night. Planemos are solitary wanderers, sentinels of the galaxy. But just because it's out there drifting in space, doesn't mean a planemo is dead. If the planemo is a rocky world, it could well have life on it. A small rocky planemo without an atmosphere will slumber in extreme cold, far colder than the coldest winter's day at our own South Pole. But a planemo large enough to retain an atmosphere traps the heat generated when the planet was first formed. It is the ultimate greenhouse effect. The heat and energy comes from the molten core deep inside the lonely planet. If the planemo is a gas giant like Jupiter, it may have a system of moons. The gravitational pull between the planemo and its moons creates friction causing the interior of the moons to stay warm. These moons could also have life on them, in the same way that Jupiter's moon Io has volcanoes and has a lot of heat energy being generated by interactions with Jupiter and the other moons. If anything lives here, 
it will be single-cell organisms like common bacteria found on Earth, not complex life forms. Without a sun to provide photosynthesis, these tiny organisms derive their energy from the chemistry in the soil of the planemo or its moon. Similar conditions do exist on Earth. Colonies of bacteria are found deep within mine shafts in South Africa. They have no access to oxygen or light and survive entirely on the chemicals they make from the surrounding dirt. Their metabolisms are extremely slow and they reproduce only once every thousand years. If life dwells on a sunless planemo, it could be organisms like these, marooned when their planet was young. While planemos slumber undisturbed, one world has been wracked by chaotic changes since the dawn of time. Two thousand and three. Astronomers confirm the existence of a relic from the dawn of time in the constellation of Scorpius. Most planets found outside of our solar system are located in the main disk of our galaxy. But this world is perched high above the plane of the Milky Way in a cluster of nearly 10,000 primordial stars. The planet B1620-26 is better known by its unofficial nickname, the Methuselah planet, after the oldest person in the Bible. The reason this has been known as the Methuselah planet is because that cluster is about 12 billion years old or so. Earth is a planetary teenager compared to old Methuselah. Roughly 8 billion years before the Earth is formed, Methuselah is a young gas giant, perhaps with raging tempests and an entourage of moons. Eons pass, and the winds and the storms abate, leaving behind a peaceful world. Suddenly, Two stars loom in the sky. These are the burned out cores of long dead stars haunting the cluster. In the very dense environment of a globular cluster, you have lots of stellar collisions, near collisions, systems in which one star is kicked out and another one kicks in. In a cosmic dance of gravity, similar to the migration of planets, one of the stars is kicked out and replaced by Methuselah's parent star. Methuselah is now a planet with two suns. Every day has two dawns and two sunsets. Every cloud and every object casts two shadows. Over time, the original parent star begins to expand, a sign that the star is dying. It swells until it becomes a giant red star and spills onto the neutron star. The neutron star devours the red giant. Today, Methuselah is a world imprisoned by the skeletons of two dead stars the stripped core of the red giant and its companion, the pulsing neutron star, 